video of the 20 best cars I've driven in the last 20 years after a brief message from our sponsor. Welcome to West Town Mazda, where our customer are like family. Whether you're looking for a new or pre-owned vehicle, or just need to service your beloved Mazda, come to see us, we'll be happy to have you. Happy New Year, everybody! It's 2020 now, holy cow. The Millennium Party was 20 years ago. Feels just like yesterday. Maybe I'm just that old. Well, in these last 20 years, I've gotten to drive some pretty interesting cars. So, I thought I'd make up a list of the 20 best cars I've driven over the past 20 years. Now, the cars on this list are the ones I've enjoyed driving the most. I'm not talking about significant improvements in efficiency or uh, uh, technology. It's basically fun cars. Everything that I really, really enjoyed driving. So, you may disagree with my choices, but these are just my choices. So the cars on the list are um, in alphabetical order. So they're not in my least favorite of the 20 to my favorite. They're all pretty much my favorite. Without further ado, let's start with the list. The first car on the list is the new generation of the Acura NSX. Even the old one qualifies because they made the original NSX with some minor improvements over the years up until 2005 but while I liked that car every time I drove it I wished it had a bit more power it felt like it needed a bit more to make it truly exciting well, they solved that issue when they introduced the new NSX in 2017 uh, with its twin turbo V6 plus three electric motors set up. It is stupendously quick. We're talking about a vehicle that'll do the zero to 100 sprint in under three seconds. So it's a proper... <laughs> that it's a fairly comfortable car you can use pretty much every day uh, and being a Honda Acura product it'll be reliable so a sensible usable supercar and because it's a hybrid you drive it carefully enough it's also very efficient so it can do pretty much anything I say pretty much anything because I have driven these in the wet in cold climates and the car is a little too stiff it does like to come around on you so um, not the ideal winter car but I do uh, enjoy driving these so Akron SX so, the list is extremely rare we're talking about something they've probably made 13 of in the entire world. 13 road cars at least. Talking about the Ascari KZ1. I think I'm the only Canadian based journalist who's gotten to drive that car. And I got to do that back in 2006. And the fact I uh, managed to get that drive still amuses me. I don't know how uh, it all actually worked, but it did. And I got access to that car by myself for half a day. Um, I enjoyed it. It was a all carbon bodied vehicle. It was all built in house. Uh, they used very minimal 
parts bin equipment on that vehicle. They tried to make pretty much everything themselves. Um, what they didn't make themselves was the engine. It was a uh, BMW uh, V8 from the M5, uh, I believe the E39. And instead of 400 horsepower, it was massaged to over 500 horsepower. Uh, so when you have over 500 horsepower in a 1250 kilo car, um, it's fast. I remember uh, getting out of a roundabout onto a highway and the next exit was about two miles away and I had gone through the area before so I knew there weren't any uh, speed cameras in that region so I thought okay I've been poodling around in this thing all day uh, time to see what it'll do I put my foot down and oh my god did it ever deliver and the fact that it was a manual gearbox car just the whole theater of the thing was just spectacular it is one of those vehicles that i hope and wish that i get to try at least one more time i'd love to do that third on the list is the audi r8 and not a specific r8 because here's the thing about the r8 every single one of them is fantastic and i've been lucky enough to have driven quite a few driven coupes convertibles v8s v10s manuals rtronic which was the single clutch system the dual clutch transmission vehicles every single one of them has been fantastic and given that this is audi's first supercar kudos to them for getting it right and we don't know if the future holds any more r8s but what we've seen so far two generations of the model they've done a phenomenal job and um, yeah when that car is gone i'm gonna seriously miss it but r8 one of the best we've seen in this decade in the last two decades in fact Another car that's on my list is uh, one that has been out of production for a long time and its maker had shown some interest in bringing a vehicle like that back again but then they didn't and I'm sad they didn't. I'm talking about the uh, Bentley Azure. Um, Bentley has moved on to just developing different versions of the Continental series, which are fantastic cars. Um, they're fast, they're comfortable, they have all the tech, but there was just something extra special about the Azure. Um, it was an older platform. Uh, it had the big Bentley 6.75 liter twin turbo V8 engine. So effortless grunt. Um, the one I drove back in 2008 had um, over 500 horsepower, so they weren't they weren't slow, uh, but they were heavy. Uh, they uh, weighed well over two tons, uh, and because of the weight, the way they would move down the road, it just was majestic. These cars really. Uh, um, really f made you feel like royalty even if you aren't so uh, I hope Bentley does another big grand touring convertible like that again um, I'd love to see that switching gears a little bit the next car on the list is the BMW i8 now also like the uh, R8 from Audi um, the BMW i8 is available as a uh, coupe or a convertible.
similar to a uh, Acura NSX. It is a hybrid, but unlike the NSX, the BMW i8 is a plug-in hybrid, which means it has actual usable range to get you from A to B. So you can pretty much do all your city driving, if you're careful, in just electric mode. And I love that about that car, that it's got so many personalities. And when I first got in it, I thought this car looks crazy and it's got these wonderful uh, swing up doors, um, but it might be a bit too much of a gimmick. It's probably not a real driver's car. So the first time I had an i8, um, the next morning when I woke up early, decided to go for a drive and I hit some back roads and I put the car in its sportiest setting. And the point was to see if you forget about all the technology, if you just drive it like a sports car, does it deliver? And my God, it delivers. It was fantastic. I enjoyed every single second with it. And so, yeah, you can enjoy it. You can use it as a daily driver. And I have driven these in winter and they're fantastic in winter too. Uh, and they're efficient. So what more can you ask for? Well, you could ask for more power and BMW will take care of that for you with some other models, such as the M5. This new M5 is not only the best M5 BMW has ever made, but also the best sports sedan ever made by anyone. There are more powerful vehicles in this category um, perhaps vehicles uh, that look better or offer a better bang for the buck but trust me as a complete package the M5 is just very difficult to beat so I love it I'd love to just have an M5 for every day running around And if I have a M5 for everyday runabouts, then I would love to add the new BMW Z4 as my weekend toy. I've always liked the Z4. I've always had fun with them. But at no point did I ever want to own one or ached to own one. They've always been, yes, very nice, very good, enjoyable cars, but pretty much that's it. The new Z4, oh my God, it is so fantastic to drive. It just hunkers down it you launch it off the line the tail squiggles a bit it's alive it makes it you feel like okay you have to wrestle with this thing and yeah that might not be the greatest for lap times but it puts a huge grin on your face the car sounds good it has a very lovely interior exterior styling yes it could be better. It's not bad, but it could be better. But the car is just so nice to drive that everything else I can forgive. The Z4, phenomenal. If you've got about $80,000 Canadian to spend on a fun car, do take a very close look at the Z4 with the M40i engine. Another car that has always um, 
appealed in the about $80,000 price range has been the Chevrolet Corvette. Now next year, we're, uh, or this year, we're going to see a new kind of Corvette, uh, the C8, which will be the first proper mid-engined Corvette. I know some people say that even the old ones with the front engine layout, the engine was so far behind the front axle that it should have been considered a mid-engine vehicle. But still, I call those front engine, the new C8 will be a proper mid-engine car as the engine will be behind the driver. But before all that, I just want to uh, uh, give credit to the outgoing Corvette, the C7. <laughs> From the very get-go, Chevrolet got it right. It looked the part. The interior quality was so far ahead of anything we've seen on Corvettes prior to this. And um, it had wonderful drive modes, wonderful dynamics. It sounded good, it looked good. I thoroughly enjoyed driving the C7 Stingray. driving a very beefed up C7 Corvette made by Callaway. Callaway cars have been, have, they've made a name for themselves by making super Corvettes. They are the people who made the Sledgehammer back in 1988, a C4 generation Corvette that hit 254 miles an hour. So they know how to make a fast Corvette. And about three years ago in 2017, I got to drive a Callaway Corvette SC 757 Aero Wagon. <laughs> Designed by Dr. Paul Deutschmann, the Canadian designer, is essentially a shooting brake version of the uh, Corvette. I love the looks. I know it's not to everyone's taste, but I absolutely love the way the Aero Wagon looks. And when you combine that with Callaway's performance tuning, An absolute beast. Absolutely love it. I'd have one in a heartbeat if I can. Number 10 on the list. David Brown Automotive's Mini Remastered. This is the old classic Mini, which they have uh, totally modified. They've 
reconstructed the body shell so that uh, ugly exterior seam is no longer visible it's reinforced from the inside it has a fairly modern interior with sat nav and uh, iPod connectivity but the thing that makes it special is the way it goes it's got a performance tuned version of the old Rover four cylinder engine um, the car still only makes just over 80 horsepower but they weigh pretty much nothing so 80 plus horsepower in a uh, tiny car uh, with a loud exhaust very exciting I can't remember the last time a car surprised me this much I love it they are expensive I mean for the price of a mini remastered uh, well-equipped mini remastered you could get a uh, BMW M5 competition well-loaded competition but if you've got the money you've got a car collection and you've got um, cars to for different needs for different purposes you will love the remastered it's phenomenal if you want to uh, use a very custom made vehicle for longer journeys, well, David Van Automotive has another offering uh, the Speedback GT. It's built on top of the platform of the uh, second generation Jaguar XK. A car I think is one of the best all round vehicles ever made. And then you take that wonderful platform with the supercharged V8 engine and a wonderful six speed automatic gearbox, rear wheel drive. You give that platform a custom handmade body a completely custom interior and it just elevates of what an XK was makes it better yes they're very expensive you could essentially buy nine brand new Jaguar XKRs for the price of one Speedback GT so yeah it's not going to be bought by someone who's buying just one or two sports cars or supercars there are people in this world who have a car collection over 50 cars they have helicopters they have private jets the speedback gt is like a road going jet it will be the perfect continental cruiser so if you live, for instance, in Paris and you need to drive down to the south of France or into Monaco, I can't think of a better car than the Speedback GT for that journey. Love it. 
number 12 on the list something completely different the factory 5 racing gtm this is a kit car but if it's built by the right person um, the one i drove was built by uh, ed conda from uh, ontario kit car consultants and it was built right it had a k-tech racing v8 engine which is general motors sourced uh, but tuned up to uh, a fairly fairly healthy 600 plus horsepower uh, made it to a porsche six-speed manual gearbox um, this thing was just a riot <laughs> reason it's on this list is it was just so different from everything else I've driven um, yes being a kit car it did feel like a kit car yes there was very little space in it um, yes it was put together in someone's shed but the end result was just something very pure no traction control no stability control no ABS it was a proper driver's car and it's hounded <laughs> it's off it's a unique experience it's on my list next up is the uh, fisker latigo csv10 um, Henrik Fisker had uh, planned to build about 150 of these things um, only ended up building one concept version uh, which was based on the BMW 650 platform actually 645 um, and the uh, only customer car the production version um, was built on an M6 platform that was the intention from the get-go that the the Tigo CSs will be built on uh, M6 platforms. So he didn't reach the 150 goal, only one exists. And I got to drive that, and I got to drive that in California, in Irvine, got to take it out on the toll road. And uh, yeah, I got to uh, some fairly silly speeds in that thing. Um, it had a massaged M6 engine. It had well over 600 horsepower. Um, it had the SMG gearbox. So just foot down, gear after gear after gear. And yeah, I don't think uh, Chips would like to uh, know the speeds I got up to, but it was very impressive. And I loved the bodywork. I thought it was a very interesting, unique looking vehicle. Too bad only one exists. Hendrik Fisker was a little bit more successful with his other offering under the coach built banner, um, the Tramonto. This was based on the Mercedes SL platform. I think he managed to make 13, 14 of these. Uh, again, the idea was 150 cars, but 13 14 exists and they exist with all different kinds of uh, powertrains so they're ones based on sl 500s sl 550s um sl 55 sl 65 i got to drive a couple of these and 
they were all based on the SL55 platform, which was ideal because the 55 was actually um, the sportier, louder car than even the 65. Um, and it had a uh, Kleeman tuned uh, supercharged V8. Now the SL55 of the era had just under 500 horsepower. The Fisker Toronto had 610. And my God, it, um, it showed. So it was very quick. It was, well, it sounded like a proper race car. Henrik Fisker liked to uh, refer to it as um, a NASCAR for the road. I think he was being a little kind to the um, American public. Um, I think it sounded a lot better than a NASCAR. And um, on top of the performance, I think it is quite possibly the nicest looking car Henrik Fisker has ever designed. And the man has designed quite a few very nice looking cars. So, uh, again, that's one of those vehicles I would love to have a go in again. Even though of all the cars on the list, I've probably spent most time in a Fisker Tremonto. I actually lived with one for a month. So, yeah. I'd still love to have another go in it. So earlier in the list, I mentioned the uh, Speedback GT by David Brown Automotive. And I mentioned it's based on the Jaguar XKR platform. So, of course, the Jaguar XKR needs to be on this list. And it is. It's in the number 15 spot. And while talking XKRs, I want to talk about its top performance model, the XKRS. Okay, perhaps the very limited run XKRS GT is its top performance model, but I never got to try that. Plus, the XKRS had the same engine and transmission, same power, so the GT just added better aero and steering, better handling, but just the regular XKRS in either coupe or convertible form was extremely satisfying. I love the way they look. I love the way they go. The new Jaguar F-Types, they're wonderful cars and they come in all different flavors. And when the F-Type was launched, I initially thought, okay, the F-Type is probably better. But as time goes on, and I've gotten to sample XKRs over the years, and every time I jump in an XKR, I feel like I've come home. It just feels right. And yeah, I'd love to own one. They're phenomenal. They're thankfully not even stupidly expensive to buy these days. Um, that's a car I have to end up with one day. They pretty much got everything right on that car. So Jaguar XKRS, if you find one, that fits your budget, don't hesitate. You'll thank me later. The next car on the list is uh, a big surprise because it comes from Lexus. Lexus isn't really well known for making fantastic driver's cars. Um, they typically get something wrong and something very wrong. Uh, they'd have a good engine with a terrible chassis or the brakes aren't that very good or the suspension's too soft but the LC500 
they hit the ball right on the head from the very get-go. It's phenomenal. It looks like an alien spacecraft. I actually remember going through a uh, small northern interior town with an LC500 and the kids playing around probably thought a UFO had come, up, come upon their town. Um, it's that spectacular. You combine the exterior with an equally space age interior the fit and finish, the technology, everything is just top notch on that car. Um, but combine that with a naturally aspirated V8 engine, which sounds good, has plenty of power, and you end up with a vehicle that you will enjoy every single time you're in it. Yeah, home run from Lexus. I know Lexus had done the LFA prior to the LC500, and I hear it's phenomenal, but I've never gotten to experience that. From what I have experienced, the LC500 is just simply spectacular. From a comfy Grand Tourer to an out and out race car, which in some areas you could drive on the road. I'm talking about the Lotus Exige LF1. Only 81 examples of this uh, vehicle were made. It was based on a Lotus Exige V6. So more than 81 exist from a chassis and drivetrain point of view, but in this coloring in this package there are only 81 in this world um, there are two or three of them in Canada and I got to drive one of them and wow I've always been a Lotus fan and the drive in the LF1 just solidified everything that I expect from the automaker it's light it is extremely responsive it feels like you're connected to the car not an accessory to the car um, and I can't think of anything I've driven that goes around corners quite like this thing uh, what a phenomenal car um, if you ever get the chance to drive one take that opportunity you will absolutely love it around in a 2020 Mazda CX-9 lovely SUV it's not on my list of the top 20 cars I've driven in the last 20 years but there are two cars from Mazda that absolutely earn their keep on my list first off is the uh, MX-5 And you can pretty much choose any MX-5 made in the last 20 years, put it on this list and it is fine. Because I've driven NB Miatas. I've driven the Mazda Speed version, which was the only time they did a uh, factory turbocharged Mazda MX-5. Uh, those were fantastic. The NC, generation that came right after it about 2006 model year um, 
loved every single iteration of that I've driven. And it might just even be my favorite generation of the MX-5. At least from a styling point of view, it really is. Right, they did the uh, uh, power retractable hardtop version. I think that just looks spectacular. When the roof is down, the way they've done the tonneau cover, it's just excellent. The latest MX-5. Thrill to drive. It's got the most power of any MX-5. They've got a, it's got 181 horsepower now. Um, you drive that thing well, it's equivalent to vehicles with about 300 horsepower. Uh, it's light, it's responsive. Um, pure driver's car. Absolutely, absolutely love that car. If there is a car I might love even more, it's gotta be the RX-8. Mazda brought back the rotary in the early 2000s, I believe it was 2004 model year for the RX-8. And again, they showed how sweet that spinning Dorito engine is. it sounds the way it responds couple that with a fantastic chassis it is just so wonderful to drive especially on a twisty road I miss the RX-8 hope I get to sample it again someday all right and now we come to the uh, last car on the list Last but not least, I mentioned earlier that Bentley has given up on the big Grand Touring convertible, which was the Azure. But thankfully, Rolls Royce has not. The Dawn is their latest convertible. It's been around for a few years now, and I got to drive one in the most perfect setting. I picked up the car from the Rolls-Royce factory in Chichester. That's where the Goodwood Festival of Speed takes place. I picked up the car from the factory. I had it for half a day. They had in fact said, bring it back tomorrow. But I was flying out the next morning and I had some distance to travel before that. So, uh, I only kept it half a day, but I had so much fun. I went up the Goodwood Hill climb in that car a couple of times, had an absolute blast. And it's just the proper luxury convertible. If you have the money, why wouldn't you have that car, that kind of car? Uh, it's opulence at its very best. They're over half a million dollars here in Canada. That kind of money will buy you some ridiculously fast supercar. But yeah, if you've already got that, why not have a Rolls Royce Dawn? If you're showing up to a party at the Yacht Club or showing up to a film premiere, it might seem kind of ridiculous climbing out of a low-slung supercar with its door swinging open and you stumbling out of it. It's much more elegant when you're stepping out of a Rolls Royce Dawn, so I've got that.
that's it. That's my list of the 20 best vehicles I've driven in the last 20 years. Let me know what you agree with, what you don't agree with. And the um, goal is to bring a lot more exciting, interesting videos this year. Thank you for watching. Bye. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please subscribe to Automotive Affairs and click the notification bell.